1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 56. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 56. This is the first message in a series entitled The Promises of the Law. The Promises of the Law. How many there will be, I don't know. I'm sure close to 20 or more. But uh, the promises of the law, 1 Kings 8 and verse 56. Solomon is praying. And in his prayer he says this. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. The very phrase, the promises of the law, seems strange to our ears and contradictory to our thinking. When we think of the law, we normally think of precepts and statutes and judgments, but we do not usually think of promises. Uh, yet the truth is there is indeed promises in the law, and Solomon certainly mentioned these in 1 Kings 8 and verse 56. The word promise is really not necessary in order to have a lawful and legitimate promise. Usually when we are making promises, we will say something like this, I promise you. But if Steve and I were going to work together, I could say something like this to Steve, if you will do this for me, then I will do that for you. So basically I have promised him that if he responds in one particular way, then I'll respond in another way. So it is basically a promise, although I've not used the word promise. In other words, I have obligated myself, and so therefore it is indeed a promise. Now there's a valid distinction, and I might also add a vital distinction, between the promises of the law and the promise that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and David. The promise of salvation is in opposition to the law for a very simple reason. The law could not save, did not save, and was never intended to save. No one can be justified, no one can be saved by keeping the law. No one can be saved by works. Now I'm going to quote some scriptures and I want you to listen very carefully because in the future I'm going to come back to these scriptures and we're going to be looking at them. But right now I just want to to lay upon you and emphasize one thing, that salvation is not by the law and could never be by the law. Romans 3 and verse 20 tells us this, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So very pointedly, there is no one justified by deeds of the law. In Romans 3 and verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Again, the Word of God is telling us we cannot be justified by the law. Galatians 2 and verse 16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It cannot get any plainer than this. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The apostle said in Galatians 2 and verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So righteousness cannot come by the law for salvation. And then Galatians 3 and verse 18, the apostle said, For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now, I want to tell you something about the law. I've said this many times before, and I'm probably going to say it a number of times before we finish this series. But the law demands three things from every individual. It demands a personal obedience, a perfect obedience, and a perpetual obedience. Obviously, no one can render to the law that which it demands. The only one that is ever 
rendered to the law that which it demands is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is indeed the God-man. So let me just demonstrate this. If you were somehow, in some way, by a miracle of God's grace, if you were to become absolutely perfect today, you never sinned again the rest of your life, either in thought, word, or deed. You were absolutely, totally perfect. Would that get you into heaven? And the answer is no. Because what about all those sins that you committed before you got perfect? They would have to be dealt with and they would have to be answered. So obviously the scripture is making it clear that no one can be justified by the works or by law keeping. All of that is absolutely impossible. Now when I speak concerning the promises of the law, I'm not necessarily speaking about salvation. Salvation did not come by the law. Salvation came by faith in Jesus Christ. However, I'm going to point out in the future that there could not be a real genuine salvation without the law, although salvation did not come by the law. It came by the Lord Jesus Christ, who rendered a perfect obedience to the law and was also the perfect sacrifice. Now, if you look in 1 Kings 8 and verse 56 again, Solomon says, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. Note now, there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. So obviously there are promises in the law. And if you look in your Bibles very quickly to the book of Joshua, the book of Joshua, notice if you would Joshua 23 and verse 14, then we'll go to the New Testament. Joshua chapter 23, verse 14, after the book of Deuteronomy, you have the book of Joshua. Joshua, notice 23 and verse 14. The promises here are referred to as good things. Notice in Joshua 23 and verse 14, Joshua says, And behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth, that is, he's dying. And you know in all your hearts and all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. So, in Joshua 23, the promises here are referred to as the good things. Now, if you would turn over in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, and look at verse 6. Hebrews, chapter 8, and verse 6. I want you to follow with me because I want you to see what the Scripture says very plainly. Hebrews, chapter 8, and note, if you would please, verse 6. But now hath he, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now, if the new covenant was established upon better promises, then obviously the old covenant had promises as well. But the new covenant just is superior. It has better promises. So obviously, then, we do indeed have promises in the Old Testament. In fact, the Bible tells us in first, or not in first, but in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20, for all the promises of God in Him are yea and amen to the glory of God. So it doesn't matter if the promises in the Old Testament or the promises in the New Testament, all the promises in Jesus Christ are yea and amen to the glory of God the Father. Now, I've already made this statement, but I'm going to show it to you from Scripture. You do not have to have the word promise in order to have a promise. I want you to turn back in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7, if you would. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And we're going to begin reading at verse 12 and read through verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 12. And I want you to note, if you would that there are promises that are clearly stated here without the use of the word promise. So Deuteronomy 7, verse 12, 
Wherefore it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. And he will love thee, and bless thee, and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb, and the fruit of thy land, thy corn, and thy wine, and thine oil, the increase of thine kind, and the flocks of thy sheep, in the land which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male nor female barren among you, or among your cattle. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. Now, obviously, there are promises in these verses, although the word promise is not used. So God is saying, if you obey me and do that which is right, I promise you blessings. And here are some of these blessings that are listed. If you'd look in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29. I'm sorry, verse 9. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 9. God says, Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. So here is an implied promise. If we are obedient, then God is going to make us promise or, or prosper in all that we do. If you would turn right on over now to the book of Joshua chapter 1, you will see this thought exemplified in what God said to Joshua. Joshua 1, beginning there with verse 7. Joshua 1, verse 7 God says to Joshua, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Why? That thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all uh, to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. So God says, as long as you obey me, you're going to be prosperous, and you're going to have good success. Now, you have to understand that there are indeed promises in the law. There are also curses in the law. I'm not going to go over this now because I will be going over it in the future. But if you want to understand the sanctions that are mentioned in the Bible, and a sanction can be either good or bad, it can be positive or negative, all you have to do is read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, because there are blessings if you obey, and there are curses if you disobey. Now, what is happening today and what has happened in time past is that there are a lot of people that are coming out and they are denying and denigrating the Old Testament. In fact, there was one pastor who said recently, and I'm quoting, he said it publicly in a sermon, that it is time to unhitch from the Old Testament. Uh, this same pastor also denounced the Ten Commandments. Now, you know, I can understand an unbeliever denouncing the Ten Commandments, and even denouncing the Bible, but not a Christian and not a pastor. <laughs> I can understand why in Washington and in our state capitals they do not want the Ten Commandments posted because that makes a hostile workforce for them, you know, in a hostile work environment. So they don't want to be reminded, thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not kill. I understand that. But for a pastor to come up and say, it's time to unhitch from the old. Testament. And so many have gone so far as they are going to relegate the Old Testament to a theological dump. And they're basically saying it has no value, it has no application, and it is basically worthless, and they are denying the validity of the Old Testament. Well, let me give you some scriptures. Uh, how about this one? Most of you know this one. Second Corinthians, not Second Corinthians, I'm sorry. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where the Scripture says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, 
for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now the Bible says all Scripture is inspired of God. All Scripture is God-breathed. Now, if the Old Testament is Scripture, then it is inspired. And the only way that you can deny the Old Testament is by denying that it has been, is the inspiration of God. So very clearly, obviously, this passage tells us that we are indeed to honor the Old Testament because it is Scripture, it is God-breathed. Now, may I remind you that our Lord, when He was tempted in Matthew chapter 4, you remember there He was in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, tempted of the evil one. And He said, If thou be the Son of God, and by the way, in that temptation, and each one of those temptations, where it says if, in the Greek it's A with the indicative, which means since. It was, Satan was not questioning whether or not he was the Son of God. Literally what he was saying is, since you are the Son of God, command these stones that they may be turned into bread. And our Lord responded, it is written, man shall live by every word of God that proceedeth out of his mouth. So if the Old Testament is the Word of God, it proceeds from the mouth of God, and someone who would deny and denigrate and denounce the Old Testament has to deny and denigrate and denounce God Himself. Because God breathed these Scriptures. They are indeed the inspired Word of God. May I also remind you of this. In Romans 15 in verse 4, the Apostle Paul said, For once everything were written aforetime, he's talking about the Old Testament, once everything was written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Once everything was written aforetime, was written for our learning. Now, the interesting thing is this. Both of these passages, Romans 15 and verse 4, and 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, have reference to the Old Testament. How do we know that? Because when Paul wrote in Romans 15 and verse 4, and in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the New Testament had not been completed. He was talking primarily of the Old Testament. Of course, it would apply to whatever was written in the New Testament at that particular time. But primarily, it had reference to the Old Testament. And may I also remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul took what happened to Israel in the Old Testament and applied it to the Corinthian church. And twice in that passage, he says, these are our examples. So he brought what happened to Israel out of the Old Testament and made an application to the Corinthian church in the New Testament. Now I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. And let's begin reading there with verse 17. I want you to see what our Lord says. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Watch carefully. Matthew 5 verse 17. Our Lord says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now let me just stop there for a moment. Think not. Uh, the, the impact of these words are the same as when the Apostle Paul said, God forbid. Literally, when our Lord says, Think not, here's what He's saying. Don't even let this thought enter in your mind. Perish the thought. So he says, think not, don't even begin to let this thought enter into your mind, that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets, I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. And the word destroy there literally means to abrogate, to nullify, to set aside, to invalidate. God said, I didn't come to do that. He said, I came to fulfill. Play ra'o means to put into full force as continuous. So he says, don't even let this enter into your mind. Verse 18 for verily I send to you till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, 
shall in no wise pass from the law to law be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the interesting thing is, our Lord said in verse 17, and I'll come back to this passage, but He says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The phrase, the law and the prophets, refer to the totality of the Old Testament. Let me show you how this is used. In Matthew chapter 22, if you want to turn right over there, Matthew chapter 22, our Lord has been asked, what is the greatest of the commandments? He does not cite one of the ten. Look, if you would, please, verse 36, Matthew 22. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself. Now watch verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. Now, when we think of our divisions in the Old Testament, we think about, we say, there's the law, uh, there's the historical books, there's the poetical books, there's the major prophets, there's the minor prophets. But in Bible times, they just simply referred to the Old Testament as the law and the prophets. Why? Because the first five books were written by Moses, which is the law. All the other books are prophetical books, even though they are historical. Yes, there's prophecy in the historical books. The poetical books, yes, there's prophecy there. Look at Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. Look at, you know, you have prophecy there. So it was just the Old Testament that was referred to as the law and the prophets. Now, turn right on over, if you would, please, to the book of John, chapter 1, and look, if you would, please, at verse 45. John 1, verse 45, here's what Philip says. John 1, verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Note he called him the law and the prophets. If you would turn right over to Acts chapter 13 and look at verse 15. Acts 13, verse 15. Again, the Bible says this, and we're referring to the Old Testament. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, You men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So, what indeed do the law and the prophets refer to? The totality of the Old Testament. If you look in Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. Acts 24 and verse 14. Here it is again. The Apostle Paul says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. One last passage here. Look in Acts 28 and verse 23. Acts 28 and verse 23, because Paul is now in his own hired house, and he's teaching. And in Acts 28 and verse 23, the Bible says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning until evening. Wow. Wow. Now, our Lord said, do not even begin to think. Don't even let it enter into your mind that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So if our Lord did not come to set them aside, 
Obviously, it would be unwise for you and I to try to set them aside. It'd be unwise for you and I to try to unhitch from the Old Testament or to denounce the Old Testament in any way whatsoever. What we should do today is develop their implications and applications in our present day setting. Now, there are very serious problems in denying the Old Testament and its application for today. You've heard me say this in times past. I'm going to say it again. Listen carefully. That the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. In other words, there is a continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if you denigrate and denounce and deny the Old Testament then by the same token, you're denigrating, denouncing, and denying the New Testament. Uh, Did you know, uh, according to the Blue Book, uh, not the Blue Book, but the Blue Letter Bible, I want to say the Blue Book. Anybody know why I want to say the Blue Book? The McGuffey Readers, the Blue, (laughs) Blue Book Speller, yeah. But the Blue Letter Bible says that there are 855 quotes from the Old Testament in the New Testament. Now stop and think about it. 855 direct quotes from the Old Testament in the New Testament. That does not count the 493 allusions that are in the New Testament to the Old Testament, nor does it count the 138 possible allusions back to the Old Testament. So, the New Testament has its foundation in the Old Testament. And you try to destroy the Old Testament at the same time, you're going to destroy the New Testament as well. And did you know, by the way, (laughs) the very first verse in the New Testament teaches the continuity of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because the very first verse in the New Testament is Matthew 1 and verse 1, which says very clearly, the book of generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And you have to know who David was and Abraham in order to know who Jesus Christ really was. And the Canon Bible website says that Jesus Christ himself quoted from 24 different Old Testament books. Obviously, when he said, I came not to destroy the law or the prophets, but I came to fulfill, he did not set them aside. And when you understand Psalm 119 in verse 89, when the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, is thy word settled in the heavens. Obviously, it's not going to be set aside either. So, let me point something else out that's very emphatic. There's a lot today being said against just the book of Genesis. In fact, there's a lot being said against the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Those first 11 chapters are being denied left and right by evolutionists, by men who do not believe the doctrine of creation. Why is there such an attack on the first 11 chapters of Genesis? And the answer is because every major doctrine of the Bible is found in those first 11 chapters in seed form. And if you can destroy those first 11 chapters, then you can destroy the entire Bible. So obviously, if you're going to try to deny the Old Testament, then you're also going to deny the New Testament. If you do away with the Old Testament, how in the world will you ever learn anything about the holiness of God, the justice of God, or the mercy of God? But even a greater question would be this. How would you even know who Jesus Christ is? How would you know about His so great salvation? How could you even prove who He was without the Old Testament? How could you even see prophecy or understand prophecy being fulfilled if you deny the Old Testament? You see, the truth of the matter is this. Grace does not destroy the law of God. We often hear Christian people say, well, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And they have no idea what they're saying. 
It is true that we are not under the law as a standard for justification. The law of God is not our standard for salvation. It is true that we are under the standard of grace. I'm going to point this out in just a few minutes. It's true we are under the standard of grace, but grace does not nullify the law of God. It does not negate it. Uh, the Old Testament is full of law, but it's also full of grace. Do you remember in Galatians 6 and verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Anybody that's ever been saved has been saved by grace. If you think that people in the Old Testament were saved by law keeping, you're mistaken. No one has ever been saved by keeping the law. Anyone that's ever been saved has been saved by grace. Even Moses, the lawgiver, in Exodus 33 and verse 13, prayed and said, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. He's praying for grace. Even Gideon. And Judges 6 and verse 17 said, If I have now found grace in thy sight, show me a sign that thou talked with me. So simply because we are justified by grace and not by works does not mean that we can live any way that we choose. That does not mean that we can live any way that we please. Uh, the Apostle Paul dealt with this in Romans 6 and verse 1 and 2 when he said this, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That is, parents of thought don't even think that. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? So when someone says, well, I'm saved by grace, I can do as I please. No. Grace enables us to be obedient. It is the law that gives us direction as to how to live and how to please God. It is the law that teaches us that we're dead to sin because of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you read through the New Testament, you're going to find negative passages concerning the law of God. If you will take the time to look at the context, you will find that there are four explanations that will explain those negative passages in the context, and usually the context is going to be one of these four explanations. The first one is very simple. There are those passages that deny or denounce the law of God as a means of justification. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by keeping the law. No one has ever been saved by keeping the law. Neither can we be saved in that way. The Bible says in Galatians 2 and verse 16, Knowing that a man is, is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's a negative passage. It's denouncing the law as the means or the standard of justification. Most Christians will read Romans 7 and verse 14 and they'll say, Aha, here's a verse that proves absolutely that the law has nothing to do with us. Because Romans 7, 14 says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Aha, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. Well, what about the context? The Apostle Paul starts his argument for justification by faith alone in Romans 3 and verse 31, and it runs all the way through Romans chapter 8. And if you would read the context of Romans 6 and 7, you'll find what the apostle is saying there 
We're not under the standard of the law for justification, but we're under the standard of grace. So Romans 7.14 is not saying that the law has been done away with, it's been invalidated, it's been negated, it's been abrogated, it's been set aside. No. It's just saying the law is not our standard. The opposite of that you will find in Galatians 5 and verse 4. Listen to this one. The apostle said, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Now, when the apostle Paul says that someone has fallen from grace, does not mean that they were saved and they lost their salvation. Listen to what he said. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. He is saying that if you seek to be justified by the law, you're seeking to be justified by a different standard. And Christ is absolutely no effect unto you, and you've fallen, that is, you've left the standard of grace. So, you can either be justified by grace, or seek to be justified by the law, and if you're seeking to be justified by the law, you're seeking to be justified by works, and not by grace. See, so when the Apostle Paul says we're not under the law, but we're under grace, he's not saying the law's been done away with. He's just simply saying it's not our standard for justification. How about this one in Romans 10 and verse 4? The Bible says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, it doesn't say that Christ ended the law. It says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Why is He the end of the law for righteousness? Because He obeyed the law personally, perfectly, and perpetually, and He's the only one that worked out a perfect righteousness. I don't need to seek righteousness by my works, because Christ worked it out perfectly. It's not saying that He's done away with or destroyed the law. Righteousness is only by Jesus Christ, because He's the only one that gave to the law that which it demands. So, there are negative passages that deny and denounce the law as a means of justification. Secondly, there are negative passages that refer to the death-dealing nature of sin in relation to the law. Well, the apostle said in Romans 7 and verse 10, And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be death. What? The commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be death. Really, Paul? How could you say that? Well, you remember Paul also said, I was alive once without the law. But when the law came, sin revived and I died. In other words, I thought I was all right until I saw the spiritual application of God's law. Then sin revived and I died. That which I thought was life turned out to be death to me. Why? Romans six twenty three, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what did he say in 1 John 3 and verse 4? Whosoever committed sin transgresseth the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So you have these passages then that refer to the death-dealing nature of sin in relationship to the law. Okay? Now, there are those passages that deny and denounce the law as a means of justification. There are those passages that refer to the death-dealing nature of sin in relationship to the law. Then thirdly, there are those passages that deal with the curse of the law. Let me show you. If you will turn in your Bibles very quickly to the book of Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Notice if you would please verse 10. Galatians 3 verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So God says, if you do not render to the law that personal, perfect, and perpetual obedience, you're under its curse. 
There are these passages that refer to the curse of the law. And the curse of the law comes upon those who sin. Well, if you would skip down to chapter 5 and look, if you would please, at verse 13. Not, uh, let's see, that's not the passage that I want. Uh, Galatians 5, I can quote it. Oh, okay, uh, it's the same, same chapter. I'm sorry, it's Galatians 3, verse 13. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So, the law that cursed us, our Lord has redeemed us from that curse by being the perfect sacrifice and by giving a perfect obedience. Now, consequently, we are no longer under the curse. Note, if you would, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. So here is a passage then that talks about the law and the curse that people are under who have not been redeemed by the work and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ did not redeem us from the law. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law is still in effect. It is still in existence. It is still applicable. Now, I'm going to point this out in the future. Uh, but I will tell you right now, there is not even any sanctification without the law. Because the law is our direction, and we have to obey God's Word. And as the Holy Spirit works in us and enables us to obey then we are indeed sanctified. But here's a passage that deals with the curses, and any time you begin to look at a context, you can see that the negative passages can be explained either by denying or denouncing it as a means of justification, the death dealing nature of sin in relationship to the law, or those passages that refer to the curse of the law. There's a fourth one. If you would turn right over to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. Look, if you would, beginning there with verse 13, and we'll read through verse 17. And that is those passages that refer to the ceremonial ordinances or the rituals that were in the Old Testament. Notice, if you would, Galatians chapter, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that wall that separated, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, now watch carefully, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now, note if you would, verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, he doesn't stop there. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He says, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So we're talking about the ceremonies and the rituals. <laughs> of the tabernacle and of the temple. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all of the pictures, all of the types, all the emblems. He is reality. We no longer have the picture because we have the reality. That's why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. I said to one brother this morning who was asking me about this passage, his wife was sitting by him, and so I asked him, I said, Had you rather kiss your wife or kiss a picture of your wife? Stop and think about this. 
Whatever you have of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament is a picture. What we have in the New Testament is the reality. Okay? So, He took away all of these rituals. When I say He took them away, let me explain it. He fulfilled them. In reality, none of God's law has been set aside. It has been fulfilled by all of these rituals and all of these ceremonies and all of these pictures and all these types. So, let me explain it like this. Do you remember in the Old Testament, if you wanted to worship God, you had to bring a sacrifice, you had to come to the priest, you had to come to the altar, you had to come to the temple, and if you didn't do those things, you didn't worship God. Well, the same is true in the New Testament. If you don't do those things, you don't worship God. But we have to understand Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews 13 and verse 10, is our altar. Jesus Christ is our sacrifice. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Jesus Christ is our temple. And so we come to God the Father, bringing a sacrifice, Jesus Christ. We come to Him as our great high priest. We come to Him and He brings us to God the Father. Everything that the law required in those ceremonies, He is in reality. So He's fulfilled that very clearly. Now, anytime you find a negative passage in the New Testament concerning the law, if you will study the context, you will find that one of these four explanations will explain the negative context or the negative passage concerning the law. Okay? Now, let me try to tie this together and try to make some applications. The first of all is this. The Word of God tells us in Romans 7 and verse 12, listen carefully, God says, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. Now, if the law is holy, if the law is just, if the law is good, why would God nullify it? Why would God abrogate it? Why would God set it aside? And when you posit a change in the law, you also have to posit a change in God, for His Word is like Himself. It is immutable. Let me show you. Go back in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to look, if you would please, at verse 17 again. I also want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Go ahead and find that passage, please. Some of you may have what I'm going to refer to. Some of you may not, but that's okay. So here we go. Look at Matthew 5 and verse 17. Our Lord says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So he says, I've not come to set aside any of the Old Testament, not the first little bit. Then he says this, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now notice, if you would, in verse 17, he says, The law of the prophets. Now in verse 18, he singles out the law. He says, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now let me show you how precise our Lord is. And let me show you how He is telling us that the law is still valid. He said, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So what is a jot? Or jod? Or yod? If you would turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119 and look right above verse 73. Psalm 119 is an acrostic. And each eight verses begins with 
a Hebrew letter, the same Hebrew letter. If you have these letters in your Bible, you will find a jod or a jot right above verse 73. Now, if it's not in your Bible, if you'll watch my finger, I will make this Hebrew letter for you. Now, what you didn't see it. Number one, you weren't looking. Number two, it's too small. It's, it's kind of like our comma, just smaller. So our Lord said, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than it is for the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet to pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That sounds pretty valid to me and pretty abiding. And then he goes on to say this, watch it in verse 17 again. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I send you till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle. Shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. What is a tittle? Well, let me write the word, our English word, little for you. Watch my finger. L-I-T-T-L-E. Now, I made my T's a little fat like my L. How do you know which is a T and how do you know which is an L? Oh, I'll solve that problem for you. I'll go back, put this little marker across my T. Well, how, how do you tell the L from the I? Oh, I'll go back, I'll put a little dot over the I. A tittle is not even a letter. A tittle is a small distinguishing mark between two Hebrew letters. Jesus Christ said it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than it is for the smallest Hebrew letter or the smallest distinguishing mark between two Hebrew letters to pass until all of the law be fulfilled. That sounds abiding to me. That sounds valid to me. When he says, do not even begin to think that I've come to set it aside. No, I've come to fulfill. Secondly, if God's law is so holy that it required the perfect obedience and death of His Son, after all that our Lord paid and suffered, why would God now set it aside? Why would He nullify it? Why would He abrogate it? Why would He say, I didn't mean it, it's no longer there. No. If that law was so holy and so just and demanded the death of His Son, Jesus Christ, and demanded the obedience of His Son, Jesus Christ, do you think after all our Lord suffered and went through that our Lord said, well, well I, I really didn't mean it, it's no good now? Of course not. Of course not. God is not going to abandon His holy law, for His law is an expression of Himself. You know what the Bible says in Malachi 3 and verse 6? It proclaims God's immutability, God's unchangeableness. He said, I, the Lord, change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. I don't know about you, but in light of that latter part, I want God to be immutable. I want it to be unchangeable because I don't want to be consumed. And God's law is like Himself. It is immutable. There's no way in the world that you can deny the Old Testament without denying the New Testament. And when you have 855 direct quotes from the Old Testament and the New Testament... If you rip out all of those quotes denying the Old Testament, you've destroyed the New Testament, not counting all the illusions. Our Lord did not come to set aside the law or the prophets. He came to fulfill. And we're going to see the absolute importance of the Old Testament and the promises of the law they are there. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bow to Thee this day. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your truth. We thank You for the totality of Your Word. We do not have two Bibles. We have one Bible. One God.
one word, one truth, one salvation. We commit ourselves unto Thee and ask You, Father, to establish our thoughts, give us direction, and teach us and build us up in the most holy faith. In Thy name we pray. Amen.